After 25 years of silence, David Adair, now a space technology transfer consultant, has come forward with his amazing experience inside the military's top secret UFO facility. I was uh, 13 years old when I built my first rocket and it left the backyard at about 3,500 miles an hour. I was able to build it out of a construction uh, machine shop that my father owned when he used to work for uh, the mechanics and racing enterprises and we had plenty of um, equipment and tools that allow such manufacturing to be done. As a matter of fact, our shop's very similar to a rocket shop in equipment and materials. Mm -hmm. The rockets kept getting bigger, faster, uh, till finally I was able to uh, get funded by a federal grant by a congressman named John Ashbrook. And with that help, I was able to go ahead and complete a larger rocket with an entirely new type of engine, which was a fusion containment engine. The two primary engines we use today are solid propellant and liquid propellant. Uh, there are about 61 different rocket engines of propulsion systems that you could leave this planet with. Uh, two of them are just a solid and liquid fuel. I happen to just pick one out of the other 61 engines to pick from, and I manufactured a magnetic fusion containment engine, which um, in simple essence is able to create a magnetic field capable of holding a thermal fusion reaction inside, like a chunk of the sun contained in a magnetic bottle. And when you tap that power, it allows you to have tremendous uh, thrust, which is what makes the rocket go forward. And uh, so imagine being able to tap onto the power of the sun for an acceleration factor. So that it's a pretty interesting engine design. So once the engine was, um, and the rocket was completed, we uh, obviously couldn't launch it where I was launching the smaller rockets, which were out in cow fields in uh, Ohio. So we had to go to um, White Sands, New Mexico, and that was uh, arranged by the congressman and a consultant at the time who was a retired general named Curtis LeMay. And um, Curtis LeMay made the arrangements from Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. We rode down to White Sands on a C-141 Starlifter and when my rocket myself got there, we started prepping it for a launch. Um, at the time that we launched, which was June 20th, 1971, um, a plane flew in the same day we did, and out stepped uh, these men in black suits with mirror sunglasses, and they're DOD agents. And so DOD was interested in the um, operation, and they were alerted to it by the Air Force and probably the Congress and whoever else was funding the program. Um, among those men, uh, there were some NASA officials there that I recognized. Um, they instructed me to send a rocket down 656 miles northwest of there to a precise set of coordinates that they gave me. And I asked them, why are we landing in a dry lake bed in, uh, in Nevada? And they said, uh, just drop it there. And I said, I can do that. So we fired a rocket and it was a really success as far as engines go. It was extremely fast. It was so fast you couldn't even see it leave. It's like, um, you ever try to watch a rifle bullet leave a barrel? That's how fast this engine was. So we landed um, about, ex well not about, we were exactly where they wanted it. Then we had to get on a DC-9 from White Sands and leave for um, the dry lake bed, which is called Groom Lake in Nevada. And I was asking them, uh, do y'all notice that these uh, wheels on your plane, they're rubber tires and landing gears, we're going to bore more up to our belly in the dirt out there. So they said, don't worry about it. So we got on the plane, and when we got there, uh, they were right. There were twin 10,000-foot runways there and hangars and a 42,000-acre Air Force base uh, called Groom Lake. And it wasn't on any of the maps I was working with at the time. So um, my rocket was down on the south end of the field at the end of the runways, and you could see the parachutes um, bellowing in the wind, and we landed and got out. And um, I was assuming we were going to go look at my rocket right then. Uh, no, we got in golf carts and rode to this center hangar, which was a very low, flat-type hangar, but extremely large inside, about the size of about four football fields. So we pull in there and stop in these little golf carts, and we're just sitting there, and I'm going, well, that hangar's empty. I thought, this is interesting, you know. 
And then a few minutes, a uh, little yellow and red lights came on flashing, and um, then out of the ground or out of the, out of the floor come these little rails with chains on them. And they came up around all the doorways, and then the entire floor dropped out from under us. It's an elevator. We went down about 20 stories, and um, what was interesting about this elevator is um, normally you have chains that drop these things. It's huge worm screws were uh, lowering the platform down, when we, which allows it to carry extreme weight. When we got down there, there was um, a lot of various uh, aircraft and um, workshops and offices and such that was in off of the main bay. And then off of the main bay were smaller but still rather large work bays. And in the work bays, um, we went down to one that had uh, something sitting in, uh, in, in one of the big workshops. So we went and they opened the doors, we went inside, and the room was lit up like um, if you ever seen a car sitting in a paint booth. Uh, you have horizontal lights running the whole length of the room, and they arc like a rainbow all the way over. The reason being, uh, like in a paint booth, uh, it casts no shadows. So if you're spraying a car, if you see a run and your shadow's hiding it, you'll put a run in the car. So, so this was the same reason. Um, it's a good laboratory to do it that way. That means that it's casting those shadows, so whatever you're working on, you can see it without being interfering with the light. And um, that was the first thing that was different about the room. They pulled the big covers off this thing, and um, it was interesting. It's an engine that about the size of a school bus. And this engine is a pretty much a much larger version of the thing I built. It's also an electric magnetic fusion containment engine, but it is sophisticated and it is powerful. Um, I would have to compare mine to it. it, would be like I had a Model A and this thing was a Ferrari. I mean, it's just a tremendous powerful difference, but we both were of the same engine breed. And um, this one had been damaged right in the center of the core. Uh, in the type of configurations we build, we have dual particle accelerators that cause the fusion reaction right in that center of these uh, accelerators is an area that uh, I call the eye of the hurricane. And it's like an infinity pattern, figure eight, and right in the center, it's quiet there on a matter of conversion area. So um, then this particular engine, there was a hole there about four feet in diameter. Um, and uh, that was the first thing I noticed. They asked me to look at it and, uh, and describe to them how I thought the thing functioned. And I asked them, um, you know, how come um, I'm telling you about your engine? And they said that the engine was recovered in a um, project they was working with and they weren't sure how the, everything functioned on it and um, personnel that were available to work on that was not available anymore. And they said it could, if I could just help them out a little bit. Well, being 17 years old at the time, um, they uh, thought I didn't pick up on too many adult innuendos, but I was, I guess I was born old. I knew exactly what they were doing. So I said, fine, you know, yeah, I'll be glad to help my country, you know. Yeah. So we play along, and I asked them, can I walk up to it? And they said, sure, as a matter of fact, you can climb on it if you want. So I got up to the engine, and then, um, Something really unusual about the engine, other than the design, the alloys itself, um, just the sheen and color, looked like um, iridescent color, like um, when you hold a CD disc to the sun and you see the rainbow. Imagine those kind of colors covering this entire engine and glowing like that. It's really pretty. The color of the engine was unlike any metal or alloy I was ever familiar with. and. Um, when I walked to the engine, uh, there was a shadow on the engine. Now, I just told you that the rooms were built where you couldn't have shadows. Uh, when I stuck my arm out to it, there was a shadow on the engine, but right on the table, there was no shadow. So it's not a light casting the shadow on the engine. The engine is picking up radiation off my body. So I back away from it, and the shadow dissipates. When I walk back up, it's back on. And so uh, when I put my hands on the engine to pull myself up on it, that's where it's interesting because the alloys in some places were so thin, it was translucent. You could see through it like a, um, like a sheet of amber. Um, 
So when I laid my hands on it, uh, this really interesting swirl pattern would come off wherever my skin was touching and they would swirl out through the metal, going out through the, through the alloy. And I, I didn't know of any metal that could do that. So I thought, wow, this thing is heat sensitive. It's picking up my body heat waves like that. Um, so when I crawled, and they were really neat looking, smooth uh, type wave flows uh, coming off my hands. So I pulled myself on up on the engine and started walking over it. And um, it was huge. It was radically different than mine because it was just so much of a different design. And the way they ran the, the fusion flows and, and the way you would run fuel in a fuel line of an engine, this thing was totally different. Uh, there was no wiring. Now my engine was covered with miles of wiring so I could get all the firing orders right toward the cyclotrons, the particle accelerators. Did you uh, immediately know that it was alien at that time? I suspected when I put my hands on it, um, it felt so different. It felt like a frog belly, if you ever, I don't know if people play with frog bellies, but I did. Uh, it looked wet, but it wasn't wet. It's just so slick looking, but it wasn't slick. Um, and it was just amazing, but also had such a texture, and as soon as you touched it, it was cold in the air-conditioned well in the facility, but the minute you touched the metal, it became your temperature instantly. I don't know of any alloys that can do that. So I started going, oh, this is not, this may not be from around here. So I'm walking down the engine and I go up to where the main core cells are in the particle accelerators. There's a hole blown out there and I step down into it, just to get a better look. Now at this point of view, I'm down in a hole in the engine and um, uh, the walls are real smooth. They're so smooth, uh, the blast, uh, these temperatures like that engine of mine, they run at 100 million degrees centigrade. You work with plasma physics. So when the field dropped down, this, uh, this engine's metals were exposed to uh, that kind of temperature, vaporized. But as soon as it vaporized at that particular point, fell safe, it shut the engine off. All this probably occurred in a nanosecond, a billionth of a second. So the blast only irradiated out to about four feet in diameter and stopped. Um, what was interesting is the way the engine's metal was whenever there's torn places, you could rub your hands over the torn areas that are jagged, but they wouldn't cut you because they're so smooth. It's more like um, flesh being torn rather than metal. Well, when I come up, stood back up on top of the engine, um, I knew looking at some of the interior uh, parts of it and the way it was constructed, um, I had enough of what was going on. So I turned around and told them um, about this firing system here. And they were going, yeah, wh where is the firing system? And I started to tell them that because I, f I finally figured out what this thing was doing. But then I said, well, why am I telling you about your own firing system if all this is yours? And you got, this isn't from here, is it? Matter of fact, it ain't from around the area, is it, boys? And they uh, started getting upset. I said, let's do some assumptions. This is an engine. I'm assuming it came out of a craft, a big one, by the size proportional differences, probably 300 feet plus, you know, the length of a football field. Well, therefore, it's got occupants. Why in God's name have you done with them? Well, that was the wrong thing to say because they are up on the engine coming after me and it's time to leave. Well, when I bend down to get off the engine, I put my hands back on the engine. Something interesting. Instead of the nice smooth wave lines, they were now look like small tornadoes coming off all my fingertips, moving through the metal. And I pulled my hands back, put them back on. There they were, but they were starting to calm down a little bit. And then I realized what this thing was. Uh, they grabbed hold of me, the Air Force guy did. We got back in the golf cart and we were riding back up to the surface. And I'm sitting there thinking, I just realized what this engine is. It's a symbiotic engine. The engine is alive. It is an engine that's capable. The reason they couldn't figure out the firing order is that the tubing that was cascading all over its body looked like the same pattern you would have from a brain stem of a neurosynaptic ordering firing order. So what's happening is when the pilots sit down their seats, their thought waves 
drive the engine. When I first touched the engine, I was curious and awed by it. The wavelengths were smooth off my fingers. When I was getting off down from it, I was totally angry. The engine was not picking up radiation heat waves. It was picking up mental fault energy. That engine is capable of a symbiotic relationship with the pilots. Did you tell them that? I didn't tell them squat. That's why they couldn't figure out the firing order. They said there was no wiring or circuitry. No, the pilot's brains are the wiring and the circuitry. The engine needs them in order to f do all of its functions. In return, the pilots know exactly what the engine feels and how the spacecraft feels. The entire craft is probably symbiotic. Now, before you sit there and blow this off like it's just a bunch of science fiction, let me bring you up to date here to current events. I just left Princeton University. There's a uh, Dr. John up there, Robert John, and he runs the Pear Research Institute. They have a contract from McDonnell Douglas, you ever heard of them, small aerospace company, to build mental shielding for firing systems on the new F-22 fighters. So people are going, what's that got to do with thing? Pilot comes home at night, catches his wife in bed with another man. He's having a bad day. He's now got to go fight a fighter that is so sensitive. When he straps on his helmet, just like the uh, Apache helicopter, you turn your head this way, the gun mounts follow your head. This firing system now links to your brain. Fox fire Clint Eastwood. Where do you think the Hollywood's getting their ideas? McDonnell Douglas is under construction building a symbiotic relationship firing control system. Where did they get their idea? I wonder. Could have been back in June 1971, and God knows how long they've had this engine. However, it's reality. We have symbiotic engines in aeronautics. We are moving into that area right now with the F-22 and beyond uh, with our future fighters. So, which is science fiction, which is science fact? Where does it start and end? You can't tell anymore. When we got back up to the surface uh, on the golf carts, um, there was another problem developing. I already knew that um, if they could hold this kind of information back, there's a lot of other things going to happen. I also knew my rocket was gone because I built it under a federal grant. They're going to take the rocket. Well, that bothered me enough, but the other problem was something they were talking about that while I was standing there being a child, they're not paying attention. And that's when I first heard the terms first strike. And I'm going, what is first strike? And then I started thinking about it. That's June 1971. We're in the throes of Vietnam War. We're in the pitch battles. Um, wasn't long after me lying had occurred. We bombed the di just bombed the Dickens out of Cambodia uh, because the Soviets were supplying weapons to the north. We wanted to do s surgical nuclear strikes. General Westmoreland did. And the Soviets said, you fire one of those off and we'll go to global thermal nuclear war. The only reason we didn't attack each other was MAD, M-A-D, Mutual Assured Destruction. So the only way to win MAD is first strike. Whoever gets there first wins. My rocket engine out there went from zero to 8,654 miles an hour in 4.1 seconds. It's the fastest thing ever. So if you take that type of engine containment system and put it on nuclear warheads and put them on, a Soviet, on your own subs, park it off off Siberia, the Soviets would never see but flashes of light, and that's it. They wouldn't even have time to move out of their chairs. No retaliation. So if you take out the Soviet Union, you wouldn't destroy the whole country. You would take out all the key military sites and the major cities, and they'd surrender. But if you do that, you'll have to hit another country same day called China. They have nuclear weapons, and they're not going to stand there and watch us take out the other superpower. So about a billion people are going to die in a single day. So I'm sitting there going, all because of my engine? Unbelievable. So I scooped up a hand of, um, full of graphite grease off of one, the hangar door there, the wheels, and started crying. And I said, I want to see my rocket. So they thought, just a kid, take him out to see his rocket. I want to see what it at least looked like. So I uh, went out there with the two sergeants on the golf cart. We got out there. I walked over to it and opened the hatch, opened the, the uh, particle accelerators put the graphite grease, just smeared it on the doors inside and close it. When you turn on particle accelerators and the fuel is using deuterium, ask any physicist what happens when deuterium meets graphite. It's um, 
pretty bad. <laughs> it's a major reaction explosion. So I turned on the particle accelerators, no fuel involved, and I told the uh, two sergeants, it's got a fuel leak, we got to run for it. So we get on a golf cart and take off. I gave it 60 seconds on a time delay. When we engaged, it exploded. It blew a whole size of a football field out there. There's nothing left. Now they have no rocket. Now they have nothing to work with, but they got this, <laughs> this kid. So um, I was told I'm going nowhere for the rest of my life and it was scary. And they threw me in a room and kept me there for about 10 hours. And then um, a lot of noise in the outside, the door opens up and there's this big egg, um, stogie chomping f figure in the doorway going like that and his name is Curtis LeMay. So um, he came there and got me and took me all the way back home to Wright Patterson and he took me back home to my parents. He told me that um, they're not gonna be through with you, they'll deal with you again. And he was right. So that was the end of my summer vacation in um, my junior year in high school, how I spent my summer vacation. And um, What did he say to your parents? You... Well, my parents, uh, LeMay just told, he didn't say anything to my parents. He said he left it up to me. He just got me home. So it was quiet through the winter and the spring, and I'm graduating from high school. It's June 10th, 1972, and I'm ready to um, go to Ohio State. All of a sudden, uh, I'm shaking hands in line and I get hold of this one line and I turn around and I got hold of this guy's hand and it is a DOD agent from Groom Lake right there in Centerburg, Ohio and he slaps this paper in my hand and I read it. It says, greetings, I'm drafted. And um, they throw me in a car, my parents are hollering and um, nothing they can do because I'm now property of the United States government. It's called conscription, buddy, and you're gone. So after about three hours, I'm back, um, while well, I was on a plane, I was ended up at Langley, Virginia, home of the CIA and more fun activities. What they wanted was the engine to be rebuilt again. And um, we had to work out some compromises. I ended up spending 10 years in the Navy. Um, I never did build the engine again. That was the last thing Curtis LeMay told me to do, that never build another rocket as long as you live. You might make it out of here. And he was right. So um, instead, I agreed to build jet engines. So I was a jet engine designer, technician in the Navy, and um, worked on the Tomcat and the E2C Hawkeyes and other various aircrafts. And um, so it became an interesting career. After 10 years, I had enough of that, opened up a private consultant business, and I've been doing space technology transfer, where we transfer technology from space programming to commercial applications. I've been doing that for the last um, 17 years. So. I can take you around the Earth eight times as fast as you blink your eyes. That's the capability of this type of propulsion. How, how is this type of propulsion? How did you come about this type of propulsion? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, well, this is not the place to bring that up, I guess. Dreams. Uh, the, it all came in dreams, all the mathematics, everything. I was working quantum physics when I was seven. I was born with it. Yeah. So now you know how all this stuff works. When I got to a certain point, though, the mathematics were too difficult to achieve, <clears throat> mainly because there was no computers available. Now, I mean, handheld calculators didn't come out to 10 years later. You know, the only thing I've got, I have no fax, no modems, no email, no um, laptops, uh, floppy disks, hard drives, none of this stuff existed. You had a pencil, a piece of paper, and a slide ruler, and chalkboards <laughs> all over the buildings, and your brain. And born with photographic memory, I was able to contain great amounts of lot what we call algorithms. I met somebody else later that could help me with that when I was building this big rocket. I ran to the end of my mathematical capability, and um, my high school <laughs> science teacher come out to my lab where I was at work all the time. He looked at these writings. He borrowed some of them, made photocopies, and gave mine back. Took the photocopies, went to Ohio State University. Everybody in the physics department looking at this going, where did you get Stephen Hawkins' work in his handwriting? Or, you know, it looks personal handwriting. Now it came from this 15-year-old kid building these rockets out in these cow fields. <laughs> so they mailed the stuff to Cambridge, England. 
And um, um, let's see, that was June 71. In July 1970, I went to uh, Ohio State University with my science teacher. Um, Oh, July 1969, and um, this little frail guy was sitting in uh, one of the big academic uh, classrooms, and I was, walked in, I saw these equations on the walls, and I went, who's messing with my work? You know, and the little guy stands up, indeed, and I went, he says, it's his work, and I went, yeah, yeah, oh, I guess it is, besides, it's not going to work down on that side anyhow, pointing to that part of the room on the chalkboard. And he goes, how so? I said, well, I'll walk over and you know, start erasing it. Wait, you know, it works like this. So he looks at it and then he goes, how do you validate that? I go, rocket engine. And he's looking at the equations back to me and he goes, um, how do you get all your information? I went, comes in dreams every night consecutively. So he drops his chalk. And he turns around, and I figure, <laughs> end of conversation, good. I got, I'm busy, I need to go home anyhow. I start to head for a door, and he goes, wait a minute. He goes, um, he goes, we dream on the same wavelength. All my stuff comes to me in dreams. Therefore, we are brothers, have a seat. And his name was Stephen Hawkins. So we worked out some math that allowed me to achieve the... See, we're working on parallel mass. He, there's only one thing that can swallow and control a fusion containment explosion at the black hole. It swallows the sun. What is the sun? Billions of H-bombs going off. So anyway, the, that was um, how I got help with, with on mathematics of that. But the way the engine works, it's on the same principle of a balloon. You blow up a balloon, release it, and it goes around the room. The air escapes out the nozzle, pushes the balloon forward. Well, the same principle with this engine. When you open up the one end of the field with a plasma beam to open up the parti uh, particle chambers, uh, you're going to get all this matter flowing out. The matter is moving at 186,756 miles per second, speed of light. So Newtonian law takes over in space. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction, just like the balloon. When this engine turns itself on, Eventually, the vehicle is going to catch up with the speed of the exiting matter out the tailpipe. How fast is it going? 186,000 miles a second, speed of light. This engine's capable of speed, light speed. And we had it in 1971. So. But you knew that it was going to be put to uh, potential uh, catastrophic results. <laughs> Not potential, for sure. They were planning to do first strike. And they had planned on doing first strike for about the last 15 years. So the Soviet Union collapsed. They were always trying to beat the, the mad equation, mutual assured destruction. The only way to do it is to be there first. Everybody had the same speeds. So whoever got faster wins. And, uh, so what I'm, what I'm asking is why, why? you started to go public with this information? Um, there's a shift, a change in, in perception of the public and the attitude. Uh, if it hadn't been for that, I, I would have went to my grave and never said a word about this because I wanted a normal, you know, mainstream life career. Uh, like I'm going to tell people, uh, yeah, I'll stand on top of an alien engine in the basement of a top secret base called Area 51. Uh, mainly because I built an engine similar to it and it landed there and that's why they wanted me there. And I was 17 years old at the time. Um, never, despite, uh, despite the fact that I won the most outstanding field of engineering sciences from the United States Air Force in 1971 and we can see newspaper stories and clippings of me and that rocket. So um, I wouldn't, still wouldn't stand a chance. So I decided, no, I'm not saying a word. I saw a lot of people take tremendous criticism in the 60s and the 70s, but then there's been a shift in the last 20 years. Uh, the American public now really believes there's somebody else out there. And if somebody would land here right now, the American public would go, cool, as long as they're not trying to blow us away or eat us up or something, there's no problem. Um, what they will be a problem is, is that if the federal government's caught lying, which they, I know they are lying. They've been lying for f probably since 1971 that I know for sure. 
So if they've been lying, then Roswell is very likely it's true. So they've been lying 50 consecutive years and probably much longer than that. The engine I saw did not come from the Roswell crash. The engine I saw was as big as the Roswell craft. So this is something even bigger. So another one. So how many do they have? How much they got? You know, that's where the real problem is. Who shot King? Who shot, you know, Senator uh, Kennedy, you know, and, and, and JFK? If they're lied this much to us, that's where the danger is, is that if it comes out, it's not so much as the public's going to panic that there's alien life out there. No, it's going to be anarchy because people are going to be so ticked off with D.C. for lying so many years. Uh, that's where, that's what, that is what the government fears. They do not fear you being violent about, hostile about aliens landing and we're going to go crazy. No, they're going to freak out because they're going to be caught in about a five-decade lie. And that's why they put out the most ridiculous story. Yeah, we take these dummies and drop them from weather balloons. Honest to God, come on, y'all, just the average guy working in a plant, making a living, trying to pay his bills, raise his family, he's going to look at that and go, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, and, uh, and the polls are showing that. So uh, that's why I said it's pretty safe now to say something. Not only that, people made Independence uh, Day, the, the movie, and they were talking about Area 51, and I was looking at it closely, and Somebody in Area 51 talked to the people who made the movie because they were at the dimensions, the way the walls were shaped. There was some stuff they missed, but it was correct. So I figure if they can let that out, and they didn't, they're still here. And then uh, the attitude shifting. Um, it's just one thing after another. The public's attitude, perception. I can, I can come out forward now and take the heat from critics, but I couldn't take the heat from the general public because you just got to live with them. Uh, critics are always going to be there. They'll, they'll be there like gravity. You can depend on it. Uh, but that's not the problem. Do you think the aliens are making themselves more apparent? Well, when I testified to a joint session of the Senate and Congress in April for uh, CSETI for Dr. Greer, uh, we have got right on to that. And uh, my question was, um, is somebody coming to dinner? And it's not Sidney Poitier, is it? You know. I, it's possible if they have cut a deal with somebody, another race or whatever, they could have reneged on the deal and they may be en route to um, meet us, the citizens of the planet, in person. So the government's in a real pitch panic because what are you going to do? No, you can't come here? How are you going to stop them? Um, and on top of that, they, um, they're going to be caught in major lies. So they looked real panic about this situation. You know, I've been sitting on this thing for 27 years, and I didn't bother to say anything. And Dr. Greer with CSETI was able to get a hearing set up, and he hammered me for two months to finally, the week before the, um, the, the testimony, I finally said, I'll, I'll go. So the fact that he could get that established where he was at, Independence Day, shift in the general public's attitude, by the time you add all this stuff up, it comes out to equal time to talk. The briefing was uh, set up by Dr. Greer with CSETI, which I think is the Center for a Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and uh, he's in Nashville, North Carolina. And, uh, and he's an MD, an ER doctor. And Dr. Greer is um, a very intelligent man. So he had set up a meeting for Congress uh, to, to, he had set up within the political structure and framework to run the UFO question right through the normal channels, which all three years I've been watching stuff, and he's the only one that got that far, and I was pretty impressed with it, so um, I finally decided to, to jump in there. He had 12 other witnesses besides myself, and um, we all testified to, to him at that time, and there was about 300 people there. There was a lot of staff there, but there was a lot of senators and congressmen. I recognized some of them. Uh, some of them I'd known before anyhow. Um, and we got in some serious discussions at the time. The next day, uh, we were supposed to talk to the press. Uh, the other 12 were allowed to talk to the press. I was not allowed to talk to the press. Um, not allowed by who? Uh, Steve Greer asked me not to talk to the press. And um, I think he was absolutely right at the time. Because um, he thought, <laughs> hang on, guys. He likes you. He does. Um, it's because I'm so sweet. <laughs> it's the makeup. Um, 
Right. So I think Dr. Greer was right for uh, holding off, keeping me back a little bit. Uh, the reason being is that I was too much for the press uh, to get into right then because he's got more hearings, more strategy, he's got to work. So um, we talked about that later and uh, we had a little bit of misunderstanding in the first there, but we got it straightened out. But um, I agree with the way he's doing it um, because there's more testimony and more things I can produce later. And uh, so he's aware of that and we're, we'll wait for it. Um, so that's um, pretty much after I did the testimony, I, I flew home after that. When I uh, agreed to testify in Washington, D.C., um, Dr. Greer told me that there would be, he has about 120 witnesses that are hardware contacts. That's, ex that's really important because there are other contacts that people just see uh, radar images and lights and lock on and such. Well, when we got there, the 12 witnesses he had, they all saw uh, radar images and confirms and lock on and they chased them on ground radar, on, on board radar and planes, which to me in the mainstream world, that's pretty darn exciting right there. But uh, I realized I was the only one that had hardware contact and I need somebody else because if not, I am alone in a category by myself and I really wasn't ready for that. Uh, so I was waiting at the last minute if I had to, I may have not testified. But there was a lawyer in front of me, his name was Steve Lovkin, and um, Steve's story was that he was uh, 18 years old in 1960 in the basement of the Pentagon. He was an encryption uh, soldier, officer in the Navy, or in the Army, and their job was to uh, break codes. And his uh, senior staff guy walked in and um, Jay laid down three pieces of metal, and one of them was about a foot long, had writings and hieroglyphics on it. And uh, they tried to decipher it and they couldn't because it, uh, they didn't have a Rosetta Stone or anything to work with. So while he was saying that, I was going, oh, great. So I start writing all this stuff down. And I hand Steve the paper and Steve looks at the paper and goes, and like any good lawyer under testimony, he goes, I swear I've never met this man before. And I thought, great. So when I got up, what rattled everything was um, he had about 12 different emblems and he remembered them. I hit all 12 emblems. So the way I told the Senate and Congress, I went, how could I do that? Simple. I was standing on top of the engine that that piece of metal came from. There, as a matter of fact, there's about 98 different emblems on this engine. I was born in photographic memory and I got them all. So if you'd like to see them, here they are. And um, they are interesting the way they, they were grouped in clusters and they were on every single device that was a separate device. And um, I realized what, uh, well, what they were actually, not some great cosmic messages or anything. They're serial numbers for parts. That's how they figured out where their parts are. They got, heck, just like us, we got to know where all these After looking at the emblems, some of the emblems uh, repeated themselves. There was one that had a very similar mathematical symbol of pi, but it was a modified symbol of it. And it would show up every time there was a curve radius. And I'm going, there were some of the emblems would be reversed on the other side of the engine when the two parts were the same, left and right. And I'm going, that's all it is. No big, great cosmic message. It's serial numbers, just like we do on jet engines in the Navy. We group out our numbers. And, uh, but it would give you the alphabet of their language. So um, I was able to, to retain that, but also, I memorized how the engine was built. So, let's build another one.